All right. Hi. All right. Hi, everybody. Uh, so this presentation is about uh, timekeeping, timer, stick, and you know, turning off the tick, which is tickless kernels. Uh, I'm Joel Fernandez. I work at Google, um, and uh, I've been I've been working on kernels for like 13, 14 years now. Uh, and this is a very uh, interesting area area to me. So. I hope uh, I hope you will find this presentation useful. And um, so, with that, I will go over the agenda. So, one thing I would say right off the bat is, uh, you know, there's a lo there's a lot of content and there's you know a lot of details. So, definitely don't put too much pressure on yourself to understand every everything that I'm discussing. But see if you can pick some things up and and things like that. So, to to roughly tell you how I've split this, uh, first I will be talking about uh, use, uh, you know, timekeeping. Uh, so that is reading the time and how much time has, uh, has passed and things like that. I'll be going over the user space APIs briefly, and then I'll go into the kernel implementation to describe how, how it works. Uh, and then I'll do the same thing for timers. The focus of this talk is, may, is may mostly the kernel. So I, I'm trying to focus on that more than user space. Um, and the other reason for that is most of the stuff for user space is documented in the man pages and so forth. But I still want to mention user space stuff. Uh, and then uh, in the end, I will go deep into like the internals of how timers uh, and the scheduling clock interrupt are implemented. Um, and if time permits, we'll also go over VDSO. All right. So first, let's start about uh, start talking about uh, how do you get the current time. So there's an API called the clock get time API. These are, this is also called the POSIX clock API. And the uh, idea with these uh, POSIX clocks is that, you know, they have a clock ID associated with it. So you, you call click clock get time with a clock ID and you pass this structure, uh, the time spec structure, which has a seconds and a nanoseconds field and the kernel fills it up. Uh, the clock ID is basically um, have, uh, they're similar, but they have a slightly slight differences with how they track how much time has passed. And we'll go over what the different clock IDs mean. Another API to get the time is the get time of day API, which directly uh, works on the real time clock uh, and you cannot pass it a clock ID. So, uh, but that API is kind of mostly being replaced by, uh, by the clock get time. Um, uh, you know, in, in the recent past. So let's go over the clock IDs and what they mean. So we have the clock real time clock ID, which basically is affected by changes in time by the user. So the user can set the time using clock set time. Um, and uh, this clock can be changed that way. It's also adjusted by NTP. So if the clock, uh, if NTP detects that the clock is drifting and not counting um, fast enough or uh, slow enough or whatever, then NTP will actually issue this ADJ time syscall, which will change the rate at which the clock ticks because these clocks are not perfect um, because you know they're, they're driven by crystals and things like that. And so there, there might be some errors in, in their uh, progression. And the next clock I want to talk about is clock monotonic and clock monotonic is not affected by changes in time by the user. Uh, however, it is affected by NTP uh, clock rate adjustments. And the other important thing is mon clock monotonic does not account for suspend time. So if you su suspend the system, clock monotonic stops uh, counting. And the next clock I have is the clock boot time clock. This is exactly like clock monotonic. That is, uh, it cannot be set by the user. It can be set, uh, changed you know, by the NTP. The, the rate at which it's ticking, um, but it does account for suspend time. So that's the difference between monotonic and boot time. And there's also a monotonic raw, which I will briefly describe, which um, cannot be adjusted by even NTP. It's just, uh, you know, ticking. The other important thing is uh, clock, um, all these clocks, um, they're slightly different. Like clock real time counts from the epoch, which is decades, uh, you know, since the, the, the epoch, whereas monotonic and boot time count the time since the system booted. So that's a different, that's a big difference between monotonic and, and real time. 
Uh, and then the rest of the columns here kind of compare all the clocks. And I described all of this, but I'm, I'm, this slide will be useful for whoever wants to go back and take a look at um, you know, what the differences are in the clock. Um, okay. Uh, so how do you set the time you have, uh, you know, I won't go over this in too much detail, but because of all this is in man pages, but you can set the time using the, the same kinds of APS clock set time. I already talked about ADJ time and uh, uh, there's a set time of day as well. So um, yeah. And then you can get a resolution of a clock. These clocks can have different resolutions because of uh, the, you know, the capabilities of the hardware and so forth. So you can get their resolution uh, using clock get res uh, uh, syscall. All right, so that's so all of that is user space stuff. And I went over it pretty quickly just because I think it's it's all documented and you know it's pretty straightforward. Uh, so let me uh, now talk about how timekeeping is supported in the kernel. Um, so, um, so we have this struct timekeeper data structure. Um, uh, and this data structure actually has this, uh, uh, you know, TKR mono, TKR raw stuff. That's actually keeping track of the monotonic time. Uh, so the interesting part is all the other clocks are like clock real time, clock boot time. They're all derived, from, they're just offsets from that clock. So the kernel has to only keep track of the, the monotonic time. Um, and the other clocks can be, you know, offsets from that. So that way, every time the kernel updates the time, it doesn't need to, um, you know, uh, you know, redo it for every clock ID. It can just offset from the the monotonic ones. Um, and something I do do want to mention is there are several several of these timekeeping APIs are in uh, VDSO because uh, for performance reasons. So the kernel maps this page uh, into, you know, this elf object into uh, user space and then user space can directly call functions in that uh, object and uh, do the, you know, get, get the time of day and stuff like that directly without having to make a syscall. So this is a huge performance improvement. And I'll go over the VDSO mechanics uh, if we have time, but the something I want to mention is that, you know, most of the time when you read the time, you don't actually go to the kernel. The kernel, uh, you know, provides all of the information to user space through the VDSO. All right, so now let's go a little deeper and look at the hardware a little bit as well. So we have this abstraction uh, in the kernel called the clock source, and the clock source basically is an abstraction of a simple counter that can be read from, from. So, you know, finally the time has to come from this hardware counter that is just counting and it has a certain rate and so forth. We'll go over all that. Um, but this, this counter can be directly read by the CPU every time it needs to know, okay, how much time has passed and what's the time right now and so forth. So finally it boils down to this, okay. Um, to give an example, in x86 that, Times that counter is called the TSC. It's a 64-bit counter, and it is it is an MSR, so it is it's really fast. However, it's it still has overhead. It's slower than the cache head, so you can't keep reading the TSC and and hope that it's going to be fast. There is some overhead. This is high resolution because uh, it it uses a CPU clock to count, and to read the TSC, you use the RDTSC instruction. And there's also an RDTSCP instruction which gives you the CPU number as well not just the time that was read. Um, yeah, so the so coming back to clock source, this is what the clock source structure looks like in the kernel. You have a read callback that uh, uh, is basically the, 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 hardware that, uh, the hardware driver that registers the clock source. It tells the kernel that you can call this function to read the time. So that's the read pointer and then when you register the clock source, you also provided a frequency. So that frequency is used to calculate the multiplies and, and shifts, because remember, this is just a counter. So it cannot directly tell you what time it is. You need to know how fast it is ticking and then scale that value in the counter to time. So uh, 
using using multiplication and shift. So uh, that's what mult and shift there are. And you can even call the the read uh, handler of the clock source structure directly. Like I have an example there where you do two reads and you can kind of figure out, okay, what's the difference in, in, in time between those two reads? Um, so one thing to note is that for this, this sort of thing to work, like you have to make sure that the clock source value, that is the TSC values are in sync across all the CPUs because what happens if you read the time on one CPU and then uh, read it again on another, um, you know, they have to, you're reading two different TSCs, so they have to be in sync. So uh, this is something that the kernel absolutely requires. There's uh, efforts, um, the, the kernel does, uh, goes to goes through efforts to make sure that the, the clock sources are in sync. In the case of x86, the TSC, um, and there are protocols that it uses to make sure that everything is working properly and that it can trust the TSC. So what do we use the clock source for? We use the so clock Joel, source. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, so the question, one question we have here is that, is this x86? Um, yeah, so RDTSC is x86 specific. Okay. Yeah. And then the other question, there is one question. We, uh, when So when we expose a clock source or some kind of counter, user space doesn't go through the file system to read the value. That's the question. Um. Uh, so there is no involvement of no there is no involvement of file system here. Uh, there's a syscall that reads the timer, and if VDSO is available, then the then the user space directly reads the hardware. Um, but getting the time doesn't like uh, nobody uses the file system for that. Yeah, you have to use the syscall, the clock get time syscall, or get get time of day. Um, right. Yeah. So when okay. you have VDSO, that part becomes quicker. Um, yeah. Yes, because that that value is exposed to the yeah, absolutely. Yeah. library. OK, that sounds good. Yeah, the, and the constant TSC, I will uh, go over that. I'm about to cover that. Um, on the other hardwares, other than x86, you'll have to refer to them. But usually, it will be something like a memory mapped IO. It depends on whatever that handler does, right? The clock says read. So you can look at what. Clock, the clock says read handler does, but typically on other architectures, what I've seen is it reads some memory mapped IO register and um, you know gets the gets the the value of the counter from that. Um okay, so let's see. So uh, so that that's all great, but what do we use the clock source for? We use it for two uh, two reasons. One is timekeeping, right? We have to keep moving the system clock forward. Another one is to read the time at any given instant. Um, so let's go over both. Uh, so this is the algorithm for time, like for moving the system clock forward. Um, so we cannot just, you know, wake up one at one point and say that I want to know the time now. You have to keep accumulating the time because these uh, timekeeping, um, uh, the, the, the clock source might be like, you know, it cannot keep track of time forever. It has, you know, it has to be periodically checked, uh, checked in with. So this is the algorithm for that. Uh, this runs every Jiffy. So every scheduling clock interrupt, I'll go with that as well, what the scheduling clock interrupt is. But every time you, every, every Jiffy is what we call it. It goes and consults the clock. So, so what happens is um, every Jiffy and interrupt goes off, we read the clock source. We look at the value of the clock source that we read last, and we find the delta between that. That's the delta of how long it has been since we updated the system time. And then we scale that, because remember, that's just the counter value, right? It's not a time. So we have to scale that with a multiplier. And then we accumulate that in this, um, in the timekeeper data structure in this field called x time n sec. So we keep accumulating the nanoseconds Every time we update the we update the time, if that if that nanosecond overflows, it goes over one second. Then we uh, normalize it. So what we do is we convert that nanosecond to second, and we uh, reduce the nanosecond by the same amount because the nanosecond also might overflow. So we don't want it to grow too big. So we we do this pro normalization process. But essentially, this uh, flowchart I'm showing here happens every uh, Jiffy. 
So to summarize the previous chart, clock source is read and accumulated into the timekeeper structure. The structure has two co components to keep track of time in seconds. Um, there's a nanosecond and there's a second structure, uh, second field. So both are combined to finally get the total number of uh, you know uh, seconds. And the number of cycles, every time you read the clock source for timekeeping, the, the value of the clock source is also noted because the next time you read the uh, next time you do the timekeeping update, you 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 need to know the delta, so it saves the value of the clock source that is read as well. And next we'll see this is uh, this is only for updating the time, right? But what about if you want to read the time at any given instant? So how do we read the time at any given instant? Because these clock sources are nanosecond scale, so. Um, so for that, what we do is we combine the 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 timekeeper stuff that we just did every jiffy to uh, to accrue the time. We combine that information with uh, of the latest value of a clock source, the delta between the latest value and the 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 one that was used to update the timekeeper, and then we make further adjustments. So this is what this is this is what it all looks like. We have the monotonic time, as I said, that is the only thing that is updated when we update the system time, we combine that monotonic time with the other offsets to get the final uh, value for that clock. So for real time, we have an offset uh, from the monotonic time. For uh, boot time, we have an offset because uh, the suspend time has to be added to the monotonic time. So the monotonic time, which is updated every jiffy is combined with these offsets to get the final value of the clock. But that's not good enough because we need to know how much time has passed since we updated the time. To so read the clock source, calculate the delta, and then add that delta to the to to what we have so far, and then we get the latest clock value. So that that's how when you do clock get time, all of this happens, and we know what is the time at exactly that instant when you call clock get time. Okay. So for completeness, I just want to show you the functions in the kernel that are executed when you update the wall, the wall clock time. It's not important, but if you're a kernel developer and you're looking at the kernel sources, you know now you know like this is the call stack. So essentially, uh, an interrupt goes off. Uh, we update the jiffies, and when we update the jiffies, we also say, uh, um, you know, we need to update the wall time now. Uh, so let's now let's jump into uh, into an x86 uh, clock source, which is the TSC. Again, I just want to go into more details. Um, mostly, I want to go in through the go through the issues that the TSC has. So there uh, are a couple of questions. Yeah, let's that go. Might be useful to answer. Yeah. Um, so the the question. Um, let me start with the question. One question that has been. Uh, can you say something about constant TSC migrating effect of P states? Are you planning to cover that? I will cover constant uh, constant TSC, yes. Uh, not the effect of P states. Well, uh, there, there is an effect of P states. Uh, uh, you know, when you change the frequency, I'll go over that. I'll go over okay. that a little bit. Later on. Um, okay, so that'll come that's coming up a little bit later. Uh, and then uh, when the user mode and the kernel mode write and read from VDSO, that must be done atomic instruction. That's a question there. Is that an atomic instruction? And I did yeah. uh, paste the VDA, VDSO man page there. Yeah, so the VDSO so. is not a, a single instruction. It's mm -hmm. basically code. So you run like a piece of code um, to, do, to, read the, re, to read the time. Um, so I didn't follow fully atomic instruction, but yeah, hopefully that answers that. So yeah, that, go ahead and read this man page that gives you information, Roman, um, about VDSOs. Usually it short circuits some of the uh, system call overhead. It is lower overhead than system call, but you still do um, some, um, uh, some, uh, some code. It's not like one single instruction. And then... Yeah. Um, that is VDSO and uh, that is handled. The atomic part, if you're concerned about that's handled. Okay, let's see what other questions. Yeah. Uh, yes, that's a shared page between kernel and user mode, yes. Um, 
Yes, and there's a that, question on, um, sorry. That uh, after, after reading that, I think after the man page reading. Okay, let's see. There's lots of questions coming up. So yeah, 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 let's tell me, stop me if you want to continue. Um, right. Uh, so is the, there's a question on per CPU. So the timekeeping update is not per CPU because the time is global. So there's this uh, CPU that is designated as the, it's called the do timer CPU. And it actually runs this function here in this call stack. This text uh, scared do timer is run by that designated CPU that is supposed to update the wall time whenever it has its, uh, you know, Jiffy uh, interrupt go off. So it's not, uh, it's not global. It's, uh, you know, uh, it's, uh, it's not per CPU. It's definitely global. Okay, so we'll move on and uh, maybe we'll take questions after that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right, so back to the TSC. TSC is a 64-bit counter. Uh, it's an MSR, so it's fast, like I said. It's gigahertz, uses a CPU clock, and it has some issues. So one of the issues that TSC has, depending on the hardware, is that uh, it, it might not be frequency invariant. So remember, like we depend on the TSC to take at a constant rate because we need to know what time, how much time has passed. We cannot use that value if it's always changing at a different speed because we cannot convert it to time uh, effectively. Uh, older CPUs, this is mostly on older CPU models of uh, Intel, um, but recently uh, there's this flag called the constant TSE flag somebody asked, which actually tells you that the TSE will be constant and will not change uh, frequency. So will not change on frequency changes. So what you can see is that uh, if the CPU does not have the constant TSC feature, then the kernel monitors for CPU freight changes. So in the CPU freight subsystem, you will see that it specifically checks if the TSC is um, not, a, not constant or the CPU doesn't have constant TSC. If it doesn't, then it marks the TSC as unstable and we switch out of the TSC to another more reliable clock source. I'll go over in a little bit. Okay. And uh, we also have another issue with the TSC, which is the TSC stop is due to deep idle. So the TSC can stop counting when you're in, a, in an idle state because uh, you know, we depend on the CPU clock, right? So it's possible in some hardware, again, not on all hardware, in mostly older ones, the TSC could stop if uh, the CPU goes into deep idle. And to know if your TSC has played with this or not, you can check the non-stop TSC flag. So if it has non-stop TSC, then that uh, going into idle, stopping the TSC stuff doesn't happen. And just like CPU frac, uh, the CPU idle uh, subsystem uh, marks you know, the TSC as unstable if, if uh, it is possible that the system will enter into a deeper state that would turn off the TSC. So the idle subsystem says the TSC is unstable, don't trust it because I'm gonna enter a deep idle anyway. Um, it doesn't say that I'm not gonna enter deep idle because I want the TSC to be you know, working well. It says that the TSC is not reliable. I'm gonna do whatever I want. I'm gonna de enter deep idle. So that's what the, the behavior is. And then similarly, like CPU frag, there's a, a reselection of TS uh, of clock source because the TSC is no longer reliable because it was marked as such. Uh, now, even after uh, the TSC uh, doesn't have, uh, you know, even if it doesn't have any issues, the kernel still doesn't fully trust it. There's this flag called clock source must verify, which is uh, passed along to the kernel when the TSC is registered. And what this flag does is it, it triggers this mechanism called the clock source watchdog, which is constantly checking the TSC to see if it is really behaving properly. In fact, what it does is it takes another clock source outside of the, um, of the, you know, the CPU, and it compares that with, uh, with, uh, with the TSC. So that mechanism is called the clock source watchdog. If it sees that the progression of time is different, looks different between the two clock sources, then it marks the uh, TSC as unstable as well. And again, it switches to uh, another clock source. 
Okay, so that's all for time and time keep keeping. I think we're right on time. Well, no pun intended, but I was going to keep the timer jokes uh, to a minimum, uh, but uh, can't help it. Um, so sure, I think we'll move on or uh, do we have any burning questions? We have some questions. Um, I think it might be better to um, to handle them. Um, All right. So see, it seems like there is, from the questions I'm seeing, there is a little bit of a, um, a little bit, a little bit clarity might be needed in terms of uh, uh, system call functions a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, so th there is, there are system call, there are calls, you, you covered the kernel side of it, kernel code needing to get calls, but I think there are more questions from the VDSO clarification system calls, do you recommend uh, them to people to yeah. come and educate themselves I, on the VDSO yeah. system calls? VDSO is definitely very well documented. There are full blown presentations on that. VDSO mm -hmm. doesn't, uh, well, so it, as far as I understand, VDSO doesn't directly make any system calls. I think there are some cases where it does though. If, if it figures out that, it's, I'm trying to read the time, but I'm not able to do that. It'll fall back to doing a system call from the right. VDSO, but right. that's not the common case. The common case, the whole point of VDSO is to directly do what the kernel would have done. Mm -hmm. That's the whole point of VDSO, yeah. Right, so go ahead and uh, look at that, um, people that have the questions on VDSO. Yeah, uh, and then like reach this... out to me. Or, mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. And this is scope, the scope is more, uh, uh, Joel is covering a lot of the kernel side of things. So today, also, um, is there one instance of timekeeper used in, used in the kernel? There are different clock sources you can select. Is that, mm -hmm. that's correct? Is that correct? Uh, no, the, uh, well, so there's only one clock source active at any given time. Mm -hmm. that's active what, one. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, there's only one active one. We might switch to a different clock source, like for example, if the clock source watchdog triggers, mm -hmm. then we switch the clock source to another one. There is a rating field for each clock source, which tells you how good the clock source is. And the kernel chooses the best clock source from all of them. Hardware dependent. Some of it is hardware Yeah, it's dependent. hardware dependent. And right. you can look at SysFS and see all the, all the available clock sources and things like that. It's all uh, available. So. There is a question about um, preventing clock anomalies, and there is also another question about, I think the same, say anonymous, I can't see the name, but um, uh, about migration and then dealing with the monotonic time going backwards. Is that kind of in your, in the scope, Joel, or is it outside um, the scope? Uh, Yeah, it's a little more uh, involved. So we definitely don't want time to go backward. If time goes backward, that's called like warping, and that actually makes the like it uh the kernel rejects the tsc if it, if it figures out that it's doing that that's absolutely something that cannot happen uh because it'll mess up the the kernel's uh stuff um you don't want that happening because you yeah everything the file stamps on uh, on yeah fi in files fact, journaling everything goes haywire I yeah guess. in fact for the first uh first cpu that comes up in a socket the kernel actually does a test where it checks whether time is going backward or not by comparing the time uh, the tsc of that cpu with another one another sockets on a uh, cpu and if it finds that uh, you know time is going backward and stuff like that then it uh, marks the TSC as unstable. So it's very complicated. The kernel does a lot of stuff to make sure the TSC is working, it's synchronized, but the end result is that it has to be synchronized uh, for it to work. And another thing is uh, I wanna mention is trace, the tracing subsystem directly reads the TSC for uh, performance reasons. It doesn't go to the timekeeping, uh, you know, it doesn't do what clock get time does directly reads the TSC and, um, uh, you know, so if you look at an F trace, um, you definitely want the events to look in some kind of order. Like they might be mixed up differently uh, depending on luck, but you don't want events going back and forth. Like that's really gonna be horrible for F trace uh, because the trace won't make sense then. 
So uh, we definitely want the TSC to be moving forward and to be in sync. Yeah. And then there's a question on KVM. Um, I haven't uh, gone through timers yet, uh, but yeah, there's uh, there's definitely uh, uh, support for timers in KVM. Um, I'm not going to cover them in this though. There's it's a it's a topic of its own, but yeah. So shall we move on? Uh, sure. Yes. Yeah. All right. Go ahead. Yeah. So now let's go over timers. Uh, um, let's see how timer events are handled. So first, let's like in the same spirit. Let's first look at user space. We'll just skim over it again because the focus of this talk is mostly the kernel, and all of this is doc. All the user space are documented in man pages, but I just want to briefly talk about these things. So you have POSIX timers. We have timer FB. Uh, then you can sleep that arms timer too. We have syscalls that uh, program the timer hardware for timeouts. And then we have users in the kernel as well uh, that require timer events. Um, so POSIX timers is this uh, timer create API that you call with a clock ID. And uh, you know that clock ID is basically, you know, uh, how the time progresses based on the definition of that clock ID that we just went over. Um, and this is a per process interval timer. So you get a unique time, timer ID that, and that timer is common for all the threads in the process. It's per process. And there are some additional clocks other than the ones we discussed that you can pass to clock ID here for timer create. Uh, there is a process CPU time ID where you measure the CPU time consumed by all the threads in the uh, in the process, and then there is a thread CPU time ID which is only using the time of the calling thread uh, for the calling thread. So all of this is very well documented in the man pages. Feel free to go over it. And then there's a signal event uh, sig event structure as well that you pass to timer create that tells the kernel how to um, um, how the caller should be notified when the timer expires, like what signal uh, to uh, you know issue and so forth. Uh, that's how the timer handling happens for timer create for POSIX timers is you use signals to uh, expire, uh, to, to run your timer callback. Um, and uh, there's, uh, you know, I don't wanna go through this too much, but this is how you would arm it. There's a set time um api to arm it and also to disarm it and you can use get time or get time to figure out how much time is left till the next expiration um you can program the timer to be one shot so you it won't expire at an interval or you can say that i, I want it to expire at an interval so there's all kinds of things you can do with with posix timers so i went through all of this already um just to tell you how like it's implemented under the hood there's this infrastructure called high resolution timers, which I will go over. All of these POSIX timers, they use high resolution timers inside of the kernel. So in the kernel, you'll see this structure called K clock, which tells, uh, you know, for each clock ID, you'll, you'll have a K clock like this. And it has a bunch of, uh, uh, you know, fields that are uh, pointers to functions that, um, you know, that, that will run when, uh, the POSIX timer needs to do something. And you'll see that a lot of them have the words HR timer in them. So I just want to mention, people wonder like, how are these POSIX timers, what are they using inside? So it's actually using an HR timer in the kernel to do to do what it uh, what wants to do. And um, that's also important to know because it's also historical, like HR timers, when it came out, one of the use cases was to support POSIX timers because you have these high resolution clocks and you want to use them to um, to run timers. And before high res timer infrastructure, that was not possible in the kernel. So it's just a, just to you know keep in mind that it's using the high resolution timer under the hood when you're using POSIX timer. There are also two additional clock IDs. One is called uh, the clock real time alarm. And another one is the boot time alarm. And they're similar to real time and boot time but uh, they also can wake up the system during suspend. And you'll see a, a separate K clock for, e, for those extra timer IDs as well. So using a position, you can even wake up the system from suspend at a certain point of time. I believe Android uses this feature. 
And that obviously depends on some hardware that is still ticking when you know the system is suspended. Uh, and typically that is called RTC and that can wake up the system from suspend. So similar to uh, POSIX timers, we have another way of programming timers uh, called timer FD. And this is based on file descriptors. Unlike the timer create POSIX timers, which are based on a clock uh, on, a, on a number, like a timer ID, these are using file descriptors. And the advantage is you, you don't need to use signals with timer FD, you can just use select poll. So programming is a lot easier. Um, and this also uses HR timer under the hood and feel free to look at the docs to see how to use timer FD. But uh, you know, it's the main difference between timer FD and POSIX timers is that timer FD deals with file descriptors. And here's another table I came across, uh, I came up with that uh, compares uh, POSIX timers and timer FD. Uh, you create them with timer FD create or timer create. Uh, in timer FD's case, it returns a file descriptor. Um, in the timer case, it returns a timer FD. In, for deleting the timer, you use the closed system call because it's again a file descriptor. So use the syscall, uh, the, the same file system syscalls. With POSIX timers, you say timer delete. Uh, and uh, to arm it, you use the set time uh, variant of each method. Uh, now, portability is something to think about. Like your timer FDs are Linux specific, whereas uh, POSIX timers are, is, is, uh, it's basically in the POSIX standard. So it's more portable. Uh, and uh, yeah, synchronization is easier. This is using timer FDs is easier because you don't have to deal with concurrency issues with signals. You can you know fit uh, fit these uh, timer FDs easily in your event loops and use poll select and so forth. Uh, whereas with uh, POSIX timers, it's a little harder because you have to use signals and worry about concurrency and, and uh, things like that. So. Okay, so now we'll jump into the kernel implementation. Like so, at the at the raw like at the lowest level, right? Like uh, these timers are per CPU, and there is a something called a clock event. So just like clock source, there's a clock event structure, and a clock event basically is a is an abstraction on a device which generates an interrupt at a program time in the future which is a timer, right? A timer you know, does exactly that. And that's what a clock event abstraction uh, does. And you have two types of these. You have the per CPU ones, which is like for every CPU, you have a, a timer that you know, does the, uh, uh, you know, does, does whatever we talked about. And uh, there's also a global, uh, a global uh, timer that is uh, more independent of the CPU and uh, you know can also do uh, generate timer events. So there's clock events for both. Both of these are represented by clock event. Um, and in the case of the per CPU one for x86, that's the local. That's called the local local APIC timer. I'll go over that. And the global one is uh, is called the HPET, the high precision event timer, which is off the chip. It's external to the CPU and it, it, it's counting uh, not only for the CPU, but peripherals and so forth. I'll go over all that a little bit. So the clock event abstraction, uh, it has these uh, two callbacks. So you the, 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 the low level drivers, they register the clock event uh, with the uh, kernel at boot time. And, in, and they tell the kernel that these are the, these are the uh, functions that you need to call to uh, program the next event. Uh, and the kernel just blindly calls this function and then the hardware does whatever it needs to do. Um, you can program both relative or absolute time. And uh, yeah, and then you also have to tell the kernel call this event handler. So the beauty of it is that you might have thousands of timers or timer callbacks or whatever, but in the end, it all comes down to the calling of that clock event handler, which starts the whole process of executing everything that uh, needs to needs to run. And clock events have these 
features as well. Like they have different capabilities because the hardware might support different things. So there's this periodic feature, which I believe all clock events support that is basically the timer, uh, the, the clock event is capable of going off periodically once it is programmed. And there's another one called one shot where you can say that, you know, go off at this time and then stop, uh, you know, and then stop after that, that, you know, and we need that one shot capability if we want to turn off, like for example, the scheduling clock interrupt, we don't, you know, if we want that to be turned off, we have to have that one shot capability. And I'll go with that as well uh, in a little bit. So as I was saying, like, you know, finally everything comes down to that clock event handler running and that's what runs all of the other timers. Um, like it runs the HR timer timers, which uh, run the POSIX timers uh, queued from user space, for instance. Um, the timekeeping uh, updates that happen uh, that I mentioned, uh, that happens from the periodic tick. That's also run by that handler. I mean, that handler starts the chain reaction, which leads to the timekeeping updates. And then there's these low resolution timer real timers as well, which run. So everything comes down to this clock event uh, structure. So it's very important. Um, so to uh, go into some specific examples of clock events. So we have the local APIC timer. This is a per CPU interrupt controller with a timer in it, and it's tightly coupled with the CPU core. So by default, it takes, uh, the thing is, uh, it its clock is actually, is actually driven by the external bus, but you have this TSC deadline mode in it, which gives it gigahertz precision. So um, in TSC deadline mode, whenever the TSC crosses a certain value that is programmed by the programmer, uh, it generates an interrupt. So this lets you actually use the local epic timer in high resolution, like gigahertz precision type of uh, mode. And this diagram basically shows you uh, at a high level how uh, how uh, it is organized. So at a you know the the only takeaway here for, that I, I wanted to have is that the local epic is uh, connected to this uh, processor system bus. And it's driven at a frequency that is lower by default. It's driven at a frequency that is lower than uh, the CPU's frequency, and uh, you know, and you have to use the deadline mode if you want to get higher uh, uh, higher uh, precision. Uh, so now let's go over the edge pad, which is this out this timer that is outside the CPU die, and it is um, lower resolution than the local local APEC. However, it's independent of the CPU, it's outside. So if the CPU turns off, then the, then the edge pet is still counting and so forth. Um, and if, so the main advantage with uh, edge pet is that because if the CPU enters like aggressive power management states, it's still ticking, like I said. And um, it's definitely something that should not be used by default because it's slow, like so to uh, program the edge pad and things like that. It's slow and it's also not high precision and things like that. So edge pad is not preferred as a clock event um, unless it is really needed. So this is a diagram uh, that I created to show how the whole thing is organized. So you have like a socket and a CPU cores in it. And in that you have CPUs with their own uh, uh, local APIC timers. And uh, you have the edge pad, which is sitting outside the, the, the socket in it's in a separate chip. Um, in, again, this is Intel specific uh, and that chip is called the platform com controller hub. It used to be called the South bridge, um, but these days it's called the platform controller hub and it does a lot of other things uh, and one of the things it does is it has the, the edge pad timer. Um, and uh, just to show you visually what happens. So when um, the clock, when, when the CPU enters deep idle state, um, the APEC is no longer able to do its duties. So if there's a timer event that is queued, now we will lose it, right? Because it, the CPU is never going to be woken up. So 
the edge pit is absolutely necessary here if we want to enter this deep idle states where the APIC is no longer uh, working, right? Uh, so, you know, so basically that's exactly what I said that the APIC, uh, the edge pet uh, kind of comes to the rescue here and um, it, it's still, uh, it's still servicing those timers for all the CPUs that are no longer able to have their own local timers working. And you can kind of, so this is this concept is also called broadcast timer, different hardware they have there. They have a different timer that is external to the CPU and is, uh, is uh, keeping track of time. And you can kind of see this in SysFS to see which, what broadcast timer you you're, you have. So if you're on ARM or something, I would encourage you to do this after the talk and see what broadcast timer you have uh, on, on these ARM devices, because even those have the same problem where CPU power management Makes uh, makes us require this external timer to serve uh, the purposes of the 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 one that uh, you know that is internal to the CPU. So one question is like obviously you have one edge pair and multiple CPUs can be in deep idle state, right? So how how can that possibly work? Like how can you have one edge pair that um, can help out multiple CPUs that are in deep idle? Um, so this diagram uh, came up with, tells you exactly how that is done. And uh, I don't know how much time we have to go over it, but basically the main takeaway here is that uh, there's a CPU mask that keeps track of all the CPUs that are in that deep idle state and that need the services of the broadcast timer, the edge pet. And the broadcast timer repeatedly fires as many times as needed till, that, till no CPU needs it. I mean, if you think about it, that's the only way to make it work. Like there's only one broadcast timer typically. So, um, and you can have multiple CPUs that are entering idle. Um, so to, to quickly go over it, uh, when a CPU enters idle, it mass marks itself in this global variable, the broadcast marks mask. And then the edge pet is armed if it is not already. And then at some point the edge pet broadcast timer fires on some CPU. And in that, in the handler of that, um, uh, of the of the edge pet, it checks whether there are any CPUs in the mask other than this, other than the CPU where the handler is running on. If there are CPUs in the mask, it sends IPIs to all those CPUs. Interprocessor interrupts to wake them up, and that's kind of where the broadcast name comes on. You're kind of broadcasting these IPIs to fire on all the CPUs that are uh, in deep idle, and. Uh, uh, finally, it also checks if the local CPU that is woken up by the edge pet itself has any events in itself is in the mask and has events. If it does, then it it executes the clock event handler of that local CPU where the, you know the uh, the edge pet handler is running right now. It it calls it directly, and then it then uh, finally uh, we check if there are any uh, there are still any uh, any anything in the mask. Which has C, uh, which has events that have not yet expired. So basically, any future users of the broadcast mechanism are there any such future users? If there is, then it has to reprogram the broadcast timer, the edge pet, and the whole process repeats. So hopefully that makes sense. Um, that's kind of the the internal algorithm that that it uses. Uh, some more things to note about the edge pet. It's actually, not only a clock event it can also be used as a clock source. I, as I mentioned, the you know you have this clock source watchdog that compares the TSE with something. That something is actually the edge pet, typically. And uh, this can it can be used as a stable reference for TSC because it doesn't suffer from the frequency scaling and uh, CPU idle and all those issues that the T, that the TSC does on some hardware. But it is slower than the TSC as I mentioned, and um, you have to be careful with how often you access it. In fact, there have been performance re issues reported onto the mailing list where um, you know, the clock source watchdog was too aggressive and it switched from TSC to HPET. And now the system has performance issues because the time the clock source is really important for performance because you, you update the time every jiffy and you're always reading it. So you wanna be sure that um, 
it's it's a fast access. It has to be stable as well, but it also has to be fast. Okay, so uh, with that, uh, maybe we can take a few questions, uh, sure. Um, yes, um, there is one question I think it might be uh, good to answer. How is it made, how, how do you make sure timestamp uh, for each core is the same? Um, so that, um, so there is a register called the TSC adjust. And the value of that register for every CPU, you can program that register to a certain offset and that offset uh makes sure that the uh, tscs are all synced and uh, my understanding is on some hardware that's not even needed like the cpu itself the cpu core the the, the cpu cores are uh, you know in the hardware itself i don't know the hardware magic that does that but the tscs are already in sync and you don't even need to do that but if doing that is needed then the kernel does have mechanisms to to synchronize them as well using the TSC address register. Yeah, so maybe if um, time, um, network time um, is uh, a, one of the CPUs is, ma is made master for uh, managing the network time and then if there is a need to sync it, I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It could yeah. be done. Um, okay, so hardware is generally keeps track of it. Um, what, you heard, what you said is uh, TSC adjust is the one. I'm just repeating it for people. Yeah, TSC okay. underscore adjust. Yeah, just go ahead and do a git grip um, on TSC. I'll put that in the chat. Yeah. Go ahead and do that on the repo. It'll give you all the information um, to do that. Okay, so I, I put the command. Um, yeah, and look at this TSC synchron sync.c file as well. It does a synchronization in that, uh, where you'll see in that file it actually uh, writing to the TSC adjust. Okay. And so the beauty the other... of the, the 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 reason for TSC adjust is actually because if you want to synchronize multiple TSCs at once, you cannot atomically do it because you have to do it one at a time. And if you do it one at a time, then you know it's gonna get weird, right? Because the value you write to one might be different. It depends on how how much time the instructions took to to do the right. So TSC adjust is a way to like not bother the TSC directly and just modify the adjust and have them all at the same uh, you know final TSC value. So on older CPUs, uh, somebody is asking TSC adjust MSR isn't present on older CPUs. Um, I think in, it's... in which case, how is that handled? I haven't come across anywhere it's not available. Uh, like, if you look at the kernel commits, like it goes how old, back. Yeah, I guess the question is, how old are you talking about, Roman? I mean, yeah, I'm not sure about back, that. Yeah. It's definitely maybe uh, definitely at some point it wasn't there. Uh, I don't know what generation of CPUs or anything like that. Yeah. Right. Okay. But, so um, can so the other question is about. Uh, timer tick and uh, acting acting as an entry point into Linux kernel scheduler. Will you be covering that? Yeah, I will be covering that. Yeah. Okay, so yeah. that will be covered later. Um, yeah. So I will clear that question for now. In multi NUMA systems, how kernel how will kernel decide which CPU will be doing the master of the uh, timekeeping? I guess that's the question. Uh, so typically, it is the boot CPU that does it. So um, I'm not fully sure how that selection works. There's an algorithm around how it selects uh, which CPU does the timekeeping. It depends on whether the CPU wants to turn off its periodic uh, timekeeping. Uh, like there are certain configurations where uh, timekeeping is not needed at all because all, there's nobody reading the time. Like all the CPUs are idle. Uh, so it doesn't, nobody needs to update the time as well. So there's situations like that. So it's a little complicated. Uh, so I don't have a straightforward answer on that. Sorry. For the NUMA, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that sounds good. Um, but it's a good okay. question. Yeah. Right. So there is another question. Um, 
regarding HPET broadcast timer and CPU is in deep idle, uh, what you explained so far, where is the interrupt handle? Does it mean that there must be at least one CPU probably where the kernel is running? Alive no, interrupts and... don't need. So this uh, HPET basically fires uh, when it fires, you know, it might be handled by a, by a CPU that is in deep idle, right? So the interrupt handling mechanism will wake up the CPU from its idle state. So the CPU doesn't, no CPU needs to be running to service not only the edge pad, but any interrupt typically. So yeah, hopefully that answers the running question. Yeah, I think, um, okay. So if you still have a question, Mina, please ask. Um, yeah. There is another question about, um, Okay, this is uh, might be diff This is might not be um, is it in the scope of uh, uh, this topic, this webinar here. Uh, hardware that exposes some counter functionality. I have a driver for it, and in that we call DevM counter add. Will user space use VDSO for it to be accessed? No, I, no, no. That's yeah. VDSO is totally different. Um, I did put a link to VDSO in there. Yeah, um, and... So please read up on that, Anish. Uh, that might answer your questions. Yeah, and... Drivers don't get involved. I mean, there is VDSO doesn't handle driver part. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, Joel. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's for it, system it, uh... calls. Um, yeah, it, it might do some things that a driver do, like TSC read, for example, is directly done by VDSO. So in that sense, if... Is, but it is important to remember that VDSO is not uh, compulsory. The C library actually checks if VDSO is available. If it's not available, it directly does the syscall. Correct. Not all architectures implement all of yeah. the system uh, all of the system calls for VDSO. They pick and choose. Um, yeah. Some commonly implemented are the timer ones, but even those, um, not all of them do implement those. So it looks like yeah. there is one more question. We are almost at the end of the questions here. So I think that's good news. Um, okay. it, there is one question. The deadline mode, is it automatically used if TSE is available? Yes, it's automatically used. And that is exact, that should be the default for all the systems. You can change, I believe you can change it by boot parameters, but I have not come across even a single system where it's not already in deadline mode. Um, so, yeah. So, there is one question about clarification, I think. Uh, you said uh, in code, must be used, switched on. I don't remember uh, to s the kernel knob, sysfs. I don't know the context of this question. Maybe TSC, probably. Hagan, Paul, if you, you can. I, 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 I think I can see the question in the chat. Uh, but uh, okay. maybe we can go over it later. Yes, we can do that. Okay. Let, so come back with that question. Um, yeah. yeah. Perfect. So now let's jump into the timer wheel. So before high-risk timers was available in the kernel, there was just the timer wheel that was implementing timer events. And the timer wheel basically runs uh, whenever uh, the scheduling clock interrupt uh, runs. Okay, so it's running at, uh, it basically, uh, the timer wheel gets a chance to run every time you uh, you take one of those uh, scheduling clock interrupts. So it's at the hertz speed, like one by one by hertz. So if your hertz value is thousand, then every one millisecond you will get to check if there are any timers that need to run and so forth. So let's go with the timer we we design. Um, now, if you were to design your own timer sub subsystem, how would you do it? So you basically need to know. Uh, you need to have some sorted list of timers because timers might expire at different points in time. So you have to quickly know what is the earliest timer that is, uh, you know, you have to go through it by, by order. You don't want the later ones, you want the earlier ones first, right, when you're expiring it. So another uh, requirement is you want fast insertion, deletion, like so adding a timer, removing a timer, expiring, it should be very fast. So this is actually a data structures problem. Um, now, say you were to use a linked list. 
to, to keep all the timers together. You could have uh, order of one insertion removal. Can you have order of one insertion removal and, and expiry of a sorted linked list? And the answer is no, you, you, you cannot do that with a linked list. So if you were to insert it in O of one, that is you put it at the end of the list, then the it's, this is not gonna be sorted. So if you wanna know what is the earliest timer, now you have to go through the whole list. Um, that's not, that's gonna be slow, right? Uh, but say an insertion, say you wanted to, uh, you know, do O of one um, removal uh, or expiry, you wanna know the earliest timer in O of one, then the list has to be sorted. So insertion now is going to be uh, expensive. So either insertion or removal is going to be expensive uh, if you just use a linked list. So that's where the that is the main key concept of timer wheel is that we we can optimize we can get both insertion and removal of all of one by using arrays trade off space. So the other thing important thing about timer wheel is that most timers are are canceled before they expire. At least the ones that use the timer wheel, uh, they they are mostly timeouts, and they you know the timeout is like an error condition most of the time. Uh, so if it, if a timeout happens, that's when the timer is expired. But hopefully a timeout never happens mostly, and the timer is removed. So the timer wheel optimizes for that situation. So as I mentioned, we want to do this trade-offs. This is how the timer wheel looks like. So I said, as I said, you use an array. So uh, how do we get order of one insertion time? So we just find like, so in the first level of the timer wheel, every level is like basically an array. So in the first level of the timer wheel, we are at the Jiffy granularity. That is the lowest granularity that timer wheel timers can, um, can run. And uh, it's pretty simple. You just find the correct one millisecond bucket uh, and you just put the timer in the list, right? It's all, it's order of one. Expiry is also order of one because you just have to go to the 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 the, the bucket that is the, the latest, that is the next in line to expire and you expire all the timers in that bucket. Um, but um, we cannot do this forever, right? If you have one millisecond, uh, uh, buckets forever, then uh, you're gonna you know run out of memory. Like it's gonna be huge to uh, to store all the timers in their res respective one millisecond bucket. So at some point we have to do something. So that's where the second level of the wheel comes, where now the buckets are not one millisecond, they are sixty four millisecond. And so this is like uh, basically the timer wheel is a partial sorting algorithm because you have you put stuff into the 64 millisecond bucket, um, uh, but you're combining a lot of timers that some of them might expire like uh, at uh, 65, some of them might expire at 70, whatever. You're putting them all in the same bucket. So you've kind of sorted them because you've put them at the next level of the wheel. So they're further away from the first level of the wheel, but, um, but, but within each bucket, they're not sorted. So, to do to uh, to solve that, what we do is, at some point, those those buckets that are sixty four millisecond big, we take those all those timers and we put it into the first wheel. We roll over the first wheel, and um, and basically when we do that rollover, it's also called cascading. We then put the timers in their correct one millisecond bucket because they're about to expire in the next sixty four millisecond. So we do that, we do, it's a partial sorting, it's still insertion is over one, but we have to do this cascading operation to, to fully sort it. So the second level is partially sorted. The first level is fully sorted. So it's, a, it's kind of a trade-off between, like you have to do the cascading, but you don't need a lot of memory. Um, so, uh, you know, you partially sort, so you don't need a lot of memory. And then you'd rely on the cascading to, finally put those timers in their correct uh, bucket, in the one millisecond bucket. And everything I said, uh, as usual with the kernel community changes. And so in 2016, uh, the cascading functionality was uh, removed. And um, the reason for that is uh, because uh, 
the, the an observation by Thomas Gleitzner, who uh, who is actually one of the guys who wrote most of the timer implementation in the kernel. Uh, a lot of people wrote wrote a lot of code, but he's he's one of the top uh, contributors. He uh, found that um, you know cascading is not worth it because most timers are removed before they expire. So if you did all that cascading from like higher le le uh, levels to lower levels, it's and if the final, if finally the timer is removed, right? Then the question: Why did you do all that cascading? Like you, you never expired the timer, so you know why did you move it from one wheel to another and so forth? And that uh, turned out to be also expensive because it dirties cache lines when you move a timer from one level to another. You have to access the cache line that contains that uh, that timer uh, structure and so forth. So. The only difference uh, between what I showed you is uh, and what it is now is there's no cascading anymore. The timers are put in their respective bucket depending on when they expire, and then they're ex they're expired in place. So you might uh, wonder, like, okay, what's the trade-off? Trade-off is accuracy. So with timer real timers, um, the further the timer is away. Um, the less accurate it is because you have not fully sorted the timer at the lowest level. And this problem gets worse. So if you queue a timer real timer that's four hours away, you actually have a 30 minute accuracy difference, which is huge. Um, and this is something I'm, I'm also currently looking into if there are users of, uh, of uh, timer real timers that, um, that actually expire after, after a long period of time. So uh, with that, I was going to go into the scheduling clock interrupt. Um, uh, so we so, are uh, we have we are about um, it's nine nine minutes after. Kind of, do you, what kind of time are we looking at? Do we how long do we have left? Um, we have about twenty minutes left of the presentation. If um, we can do fifteen minutes of questions after that, okay. That sounds good. Um, that sounds yeah. good. Yes, so I think Sorry. we're uh, yeah, doing well. We're, we're good. I think we're good. Yeah. There is one question um, in the in in the Q and A. What what happens if the periodic timekeeper update is missed for many zippies while the hardware counter keeps ad, uh, advancing? Example: If CPU was stuck in stop machine for a long time. Yeah, nothing happens. I mean, uh, it just means that the delta is longer. Right, it, it's it, it's not like it has to update. There can be delays and things like that. Um, but yeah, obviously, if somebody's re like if if somebody reads the time in the meanwhile, um, well, I I think even that shouldn't be a problem. Yeah, I, I don't see immediately uh, an issue unless it's like really really long time. Uh, then maybe there is a problem, but. Uh, as such, it's not uh, it's not like very critical to do the timekeeping update. Yeah. Okay, that sounds great. So there is one question about I think it's related to the cascading, which is no long it's not even there now. Um, about uh, using min heap, O log n insertions. So when you talked about inserting um, timers, I think it might still be applicable. Yeah, um, I mean, even though you're not doing one, cascading. This is just one implementation. Uh, it certainly is possible to do that, but insertion and deletion have to be really fast. And with a min heap, when you remove the when you remove the earliest timer, then you have to do a heap rebalance. Uh, what do you call that? Up heap, down heap. You have to push nodes up and down and stuff like that, and that's logarithmic. But yeah, I mean, this is just one design, and it's certainly possible that there's a better way to do this. Uh, so yeah. Sounds good. Okay, that's all we have in questions wise. Okay. So let's jump into uh, scheduling clock interrupt. I've been talking all about this, so now it's time to go deeper into it. The primary function of the scheduling clock interrupt is basically preemptive multitasking. So you want this the, the scheduling clock interrupt to uh, multitask the CPU uh, time between multiple things that need to run, multiple tasks. Um, and so you can configure this herds rate which is uh, uh, basically uh, a, a trade-off between overhead 
because you you know every if you if your hertz is really high you have to interrupt a lot more and responsiveness if your hertz is high you also get more opportunities to look at if something else needs to run so there are tasks waiting on cpu waiting waiting for cpu uh, having a higher hertz means that you will more often check if something else needs to run and make a decision so basically this is used to make that, that decision the pre preemption decision um, and this uh, scheduling clock interrupt also updates this global variable called Jiffy's, which is a coarse grain way of looking at how much time has passed since boot, since we are booted. But it's coarse grain; it's not like clock source. Just a global variable that's incremented every time um, a scheduling clock interrupt goes off. It's not updated by every CPU scheduling clock interrupt. It's only updated by uh, the uh, the CPU that does the uh, timekeeping update. Okay, so that's another slight nuance. Jiffy's is global. Um, and uh, I wanted to skip these slides, but I think we're doing good on time. So let me go over this. Um, so this is a quick diagram on how uh, the scheduling clock interrupt is stopped. So the scheduling clock interrupt, if it goes off in idle a lot, then that wastes power. So there is a mechanism to turn it off. Um, it's uh, it's called no hertz. So uh, when a CPU enters idle and the CPU idle governor decides that I want to stop the scheduling clock interrupt now, it um, it first uh, the no hertz curve code first sees if there is any timer event that is pending that is about to go off before uh, the before the next scheduling clock interrupt, the next periodic tick. Uh, go uh, goes off. If if it is uh, if there is um, if there is such an event, then there is no point in turning off the scheduling clock interrupt because the next event is not the scheduling clock interrupt. It's that if it's it's some timer that is about to go off. So in that case, we don't uh, turn it off. However, if um, uh, if uh, if that event is after the scheduling clock interrupt, then um, we just program that event instead of the scheduling clock interrupt into the clock event. So essentially, we turn it off. Um, I've put that as a separate block, turn off the periodic tick, but that's what happens. So uh, this is kind of how uh, you know the kernel decides if it can turn off, it should turn off the tick or not. Um, and so th that leads me to my next. Uh, uh, topic, which is deferable timers. So certain timers don't want to be involved in that decision. They don't want to stand in the way of the scheduling clock interrupt being turned off because uh, they don't uh, they don't need to uh, need to need to run uh, immediately. They, they can run at a, at, a, at a much later time. So in, in that part where it looks for the next timer event to uh, run, uh, deferable timers are completely skipped. So that's the point I was trying to make there. Um, and these deferable timers, they're they're in their own timer wheel. It's a separate timer wheel that only has those deferable timers. And uh, you, when you when you set up your timer wheel timer, uh, you actually pass the deferable flag, uh, and uh, you know to to tell the kernel that don't worry about running this timer event right away. If you have to turn off the scheduling clock interrupt, uh, feel free to do that. Um, and uh, so that's basically what I wanted to say here. And uh, the, you know, uh, when the next uh, timer event that is not deferable goes off, then we at that time we run the deferable ones as well. So uh, basically, uh, we run them later, and uh, we let the CPU uh, uh, go to sleep and not be disturbed by these timers if they're the only things that need to need to run. And this is the soft IRQ code that uh, so Joel, runs. Joel, yeah. are there any examples of deferable? Uh, yeah, I was going to I was going to go over that. OK. Uh, I can go over that first because <laughs> there was the next slide. Uh, so yeah, uh, an example of the deferable timer is uh, the idle timer of worker threads or worker pools in the, in the kernel. And there's this uh, idle worker timeout function that needs to run to delete uh, idle worker threads. And this is not an urgent thing. 
So it's programmed uh, to to go off, but um, but it doesn't need to run uh, run run soon. And uh, there's only like two or three examples. There's another one in memory management, and I forget the third one, but um, but yeah, uh, this is an example. Uh, I just wanted to mention that uh, I just wanted to show you the code where uh, the uh, deferable timers run. Um, this is the soft IRQ handler that executes the timer real timers. And here you can see that we not only run the regular timers, but also the deferable ones. And we only do so if no herds is enabled because def there's no deferable timers if you don't have no herds in your system. It's not configured. There's only one timer view. So I kind of wanted to show that uh, distinction here. But these are just details. It's not super important. Just the concept is important that there's two timer wheels, one for the deferable timers, one for the regular ones. And the deferable timers are not serviced if the scheduling clock interrupt needs to be turned off um, uh, because that is prioritized over these uh, over these timers. So what um, uh, ensures, is there any mechanism that ensures that uh, deferable timers won't starve? Well, uh, there is no, there is nothing like that. Yeah, there's no mechanism so you like could that. Say deferable timer, like for example, I'm I did just did a git grab one of them logger timeout, logger mm -hmm. uh, timing in um, you know, yeah I, I... is a is a differ, differable timer. Um, mm -hmm. So I guess in this particular case, it doesn't matter if that yeah. doesn't run. Yeah, yeah, it's basically like a housekeeping operation where we can just not run those for for long enough, um, you know, yeah. So that's why you don't see too many because if you set yeah. it, that means it might never happen. Yeah, yeah, okay. exactly. Okay. And I'm okay. planning to convert some RCU ones as well. Mm -hmm. for into deferrable? We, yeah, into deferrable. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I don't know how feasible it is, but I'm planning to take a look at look at it and see if we can do that as well and save some power. Okay. Yeah. Right. Okay. Uh, so now let's move on to the higher resolution uh, timers. So so far we've only covered the timer view. High resolution timers is a completely different uh, beast. So in high resolution timer world, all the timers are like nanosecond uh, granularity. And they're organized in an arbitrary tree. So somebody mentioned heap, so that uh, you know the, these are balanced uh, trees that uh, are ordered by their expiry. Uh, and uh, there is a separate arbitrary tree per CPU and per clock ID. So for every clock ID that uh, you're using, say for your POSIX timer, um, that ends up in one of these arbitrary trees, depending on what clock ID you used. Okay. And uh, high resolution timers have this concept called Slack. And Slack is basically, uh, it's similar to deferable timers, but it's kind of different. The idea of Slack is you can tell, at the, you can tell HR timers that you wanna expire something at a certain nanosecond, but add to actually run, but to actually give it some more Slack and run, and if it needs, if it needs to delay running it, it can do so after, after a slack amount of time. So that initial time is soft expiry, and then the soft expiry plus that delta, that slack is, is now the hard expiry. So you can, uh, these are also called range timers, and you can give this a sort of time range to HR timers uh, to let it, uh, you know, reduce wake ups and save power. So I was gonna show, uh, I wanna show this with an example. So here's a normal HR timer without, uh, without slack. Um, so at time 10 sec, uh, like this is a minute scale, time 10 seconds, we queue a uh, hard, you know, hard expiring HR timer uh, to run at 30. And at 30 seconds, we run that HR timer. And, uh, you know, everything is, uh, you know, simple. Now let's see what happens when we queue a Slack uh, based timer. So we queue at 10 seconds, now we queue a uh, timer that is soft expiring at 25 and hard expiring at 50. And uh, at 25, the no interrupt happens. The, the highest timer is just not run. 
And then at 50, we have absolutely have to run it because it's hard expiring at 50. Um, yeah, uh, and uh, now let's go and see, we'll see if, what happens when we mix it. So at 10 seconds, we cure a T1, which is expiring at 30 and hard expiring at 50. Soft expiring at 30, hard expiring at 50. And at 20 seconds, we cue another one, which, which, which is not slack. It hard expires at 40. So at time 30, you see that again, like the previous slide, the, the soft expiring timer doesn't actually run. And then at 40, the, uh, the, hard, the second timer runs because it's hard expires 40. But uh, we also check whether there were any slack timers that have soft expired. If, the, if we see any of those, we, we run those as well. So essentially, we didn't delay the execution of T1 uh, to 50. Uh, we, we delayed it to 40 in this case because T2 expired at 40. So uh, it's kind of like we pick up the we pick up the work that we should have done. It's a little like procrastination. We procrastinated running T1. Uh, until T2 ran, essentially saving, letting the CPU be idle and, and saving power. So to go a little more into the arbitrary for HR timer, it's ordered only by hard expiry. Um, this is again for every clock ID and every CPU, you have a separate uh, red black tree, which is a balanced binary tree and uh, it's ordered by hard expiry. And the earliest hard expiry is obviously the leftmost of the of the tree, and this is the algorithm for uh, expiring the uh, the HR timer. So uh, we find the earliest one, the leftmost of the tree. We check its soft expiry time with the current time. If it has soft expired, then we remove it from the tree and we run the callback, and then again we check the leftmost for the hard expired one. So it's interesting. We use both hard expiry and soft expiry in this algorithm um, and that has some side effects, but this is what the algorithm looks like. Uh, just note that for normal HR timers, hard expiry and soft expiry are the same. So now let me show you an uh, example of wh why, why uh, you know, a soft expired timer may not always execute when a hard expired timer runs. And because it's basically because of the ordering, we order them by hard expiry, but that also means that the soft expiries are not ordered. So when we, when we find the next thing that is hard expired, uh, let me go through the example. So here the third and the fifth timer are slack. Um, like the third timer was soft expiring at nine and the uh, hard expiring at 20. And, and the fifth one is also similar. However, because um, so say when say the say the second timer is currently expiring and the time is now ten uh, seconds. Uh, since the third uh, third timer soft expiry is nine, we expire that as well, right? Because it has already soft expired. Uh, but but the but timer five has also soft expired and is not considered because we break out of the loop in the previous page due to timer four. So even though there is a soft expired timer hidden in the left uh, in the right part of the arbitrary, we, we we don't expire it because we we didn't even look at it. Basically, we break out of this uh, uh, of this condition here. We break out of the loop when we run this condition. So that's just something to keep in mind that just because a hard uh, HR timer interrupt went off and the CPU woke up, that doesn't mean that all the HR timers with Slack will run. It's not necessary. So main takeaways with HR timers is it's high resolution uh, versus the timer wheel ones. Insertion and removal are obviously over higher overhead because it's using RV3. Uh, this is needed for real-time workloads because real-time workloads have nanosecond, uh, you know, granular, not nanosecond, rather microsecond uh, granularity needs and the one by Hertz Jiffy's the timer wheel is not going to uh, not going to cut it. And uh, as I mentioned, the HR timers have different POSIX clocks, uh, have different arbitraries for different POSIX clocks. And further, all the arbitraries are duplicated for each CPU. So it's per CPU. 
And timer slack is a feature in HR timers that can be used to save power uh, by reducing the number of interruptions of the CPU and by coalescing, essentially coalescing the, the timers. Uh, and then lastly, soft expired timers may not always run even if they could. That's by design. Um, and also HR timers are not deferable unlike the timer wheel ones. You have Slack, but you don't have anything like deferable timers with HR timers. So for time reasons, I'll skip this slide or let's see. There are a few questions, Yeah, uh, Joel, if you have time. Yeah, go ahead. So the first one is, does Mark Timer API use the timer wheel timers? What API is that? I'm sorry. Mod timer. I think mod, mod timer is modifying timer and uh, so on. I would think that they would still. Yeah, have it, it does timer use it. Yeah. List. Yeah, yeah, timer list should be used. Yeah, it will be used. Okay. Yeah. That's what I thought. Um, mm -hmm. Then there is another one. I think it's more of a comment um, that the timer slack is per task value. Yes. Not a yeah, per that, timer value. So yeah. setting the slack to 100 milliseconds for the whole process is often not usable, but probably yes. there are other use cases. So it's more of a comment, but. Uh, yeah, that is true. That anything. is one of the weaknesses of it. I brought it up in the past as well, that you have to set it per uh, process and not uh, for uh, per timer. Mm -hmm. um, and It's not uh, as useful. Yeah. It's not as useful. Yeah. And it could be, there could be, better ways to uh, you know do this coalescing I, I would certainly encourage everybody to look at the code and and see if you can improve it and use this information as a starting point for diving into it um, another thing we're looking into is actually turning off high-res timers completely off for uh, you know where I work Chrome OS and uh, we actually find that we save more power by doing coalescing with timer wheel. So if you turn off high res timers, the HR timer API still works, but the HR timer API, the, the HR timers, the RB trees are all expired from the timer wheel uh, or fr from the same interrupt that handles the timer wheel. So it's it it makes HR timers at Hertz, uh, it, may, it makes it at one by Hertz granularity. If you turn off high res uh, timers in the kernel. So depending on the use case, I guess, you know, if uh, you want yeah. to save power, um, say uh, power saving is uh, um, higher priority for a, a use case, I think that would be. Yes. I guess. Okay, so the question, another question for new drivers, is mod timer mechanism preferable recommended over HR timer mechanism? Should one mechanism um, be preferred over other if S, yes, when, why, and when? Yeah, it depends on the use case. If you want lower, if you want like, you know, lower resolution, then yeah, you want to use HR timers. But uh, where possible, you want to use uh, the high resolution, uh, sorry, the low resolution timers, because those are more friendlier for uh, no herds as well, where the, you know, uh, you don't need to keep interrupting the system and waking, waking it up. Uh, because high risk timers are high granularity, right? So, uh, they are less coalesced, like they, they can interrupt the system at very fine grain points of time. Mm -hmm. So if your application doesn't need it, then you, you probably shouldn't use it. Uh, in fact, in RCU, we use uh, the low resolution timers quite a lot in the RCU subsystem uh, because we don't we usually need to do like some kind of housekeeping operation and we don't need to wake up at a precise point in time. So you might suffer actually performance if you if a lot of yeah uh, you if, can, uh, if you you are using high res timers a lot yeah so, yeah yeah, yeah it's definitely higher overhead and, right, yeah overhead so i there is a question about that any problems with the very number are you saying large number of hr timers in a system didn't this uh, question was isn't very clear if you can type that again that would be great um that's not a very clear question. At least, maybe, maybe um, Joel, maybe you and you can understand it. Any problems with very number of HR timers in a system? Any ways to mitigate it? 
Uh, no, there's no way to mitigate it. It's what you ask. Large for. number. Okay. Yeah. yeah so sorry. there, there is a default slack. Like even I believe you cannot put a slack of zero. There's a minimum slack. Uh, maybe the default is not zero. There's a. I know there's a minimum slack that you have to that that all HR timers are programmed with. So uh, I need to look into that. But that kind of essentially means that you can't have a timer go HR timer go off every nanosecond. It, it will still uh, be coalesced uh, through that. Uh, so that's one mitigation that I can think of. I think the question is like, what happens if you queue like a, a ton of HR timers mm -hmm. th that are going off very often? And I haven't come across anybody reporting a problem like that. Um, yeah. Uh, hey, that would be a good test. Yeah. To write. To yeah, maybe a case, the case of test. Yeah. Yeah. Sure, will be very happy to take a case of test. Yeah. So the, we do have a bunch, but yeah, this could be another one. Um, there is another uh, question here. Is there any actual measurement control accounting of effective timer reading? Precision, not resolution. The regular, not, not uh, non-RT kernel. Does it boil down to GFIS? Yeah, so I have done measurements uh, of, uh, so the, let me understand what the, so this is timer precision, right? Um, is there any actual measurement? So uh, like the kernel doesn't measure it, but there are applications that measure the precision. So if you run this cyclic test application, for example, it will measure the latency of timers. So it will tell you how, how uh, small of a granularity your uh, timer has, because it expects to go off at a certain time and there, there's always, always some kind of delay, right? So if you don't have high risk timers, um, then cyclic test will show you that, you know, the latency is so and so of your timer. So there's applications like that that measure it, measure it. But the kernel doesn't really care, like it doesn't measure it on its own or anything like that. Okay, I think that's all we have. Um... Okay, so just to look at the time, I, I just want to see how many slides I have left. Let's see here. Yeah, so I'm almost toward the end of it. Um, I was going to go into the periodic tick, uh, but I think at this point, people might be too overloaded with information, but I can, certainly I don't have shortage of, uh, of information. Um, I was going to go over the internals of the scheduling clock interrupt. I think the main, uh, then I was going to go over how no herds works. Um, yeah, there's probably another 30 minutes, like maybe another 30 minutes of content if I wanted to go over it. Mm -hmm. So do it, maybe we can open it up for questions and see okay. if, if people have more questions. Because okay. I know we, we have answered some questions, but um, yeah, maybe we can open it up for questions on the material that's covered, sure. right? So far covered. Yes. Okay, let's do that. So just to say where I'm stopping, so we have covered HR timers and that's where we're stopping right now. So we- Yeah, yeah we are gonna, um, Joel, um, you plan to give us yeah. the slides too, yes. They will be uploaded to the, uh, yeah. to the our webinar site. Yes, so everything's gonna be there. And you can feel free to reach me anytime uh, for questions. I'm very happy to discuss this stuff with anyone who wants to talk about it. So uh, do we have any que new questions? Somebody wants you to finish <laughs> up the remaining slides. Um, but I don't know if that's a show of hands. If, if people... <laughs> we do have only 10 more minutes, I think, though, don't we? Yeah, right. Um, yeah, you won't be able to finish all of the content, I think. Yeah. There's only one person that said that. That one person could be like, oh, do you want to do 10 more push-ups? Yes, <laughs> let's do it. <laughs> yeah, thank you, sir, flowing in. Uh, somebody is saying this is a great session. There's a lot of information, Joel. This is uh, yeah, a lot thank of good you. information. Everybody kept, uh, I mean, a lot of questions. Um, so if there are no questions, maybe you, if you ha ha want to go over VDSO qu quickly, maybe you could. Yeah. 
Uh, sure. That might be a scoped um, uh, short section, short, short in Yeah. Yeah, sure. So VDSO. So uh, yeah. So some, uh, as I mentioned, some timekeeping sys calls are available as VDSO, like clock dead time. Uh, this is a huge performance benefit, and there are benchmarks uh, you can see in the public that show that. Um, basically, so VDSO is an ELF object. It is similar to a dynamic library. Um, you know, so the only difference here is the kernel loads it when it loads the ELF of the, uh, you know, of the program that is about to run. It also loads the, uh, loads an ELF binary object into memory and maps it into the user space of that program that is about to be, uh, about to be run, okay? Now this ELF object also has a symbol table in it, okay? The symbol table is basically used for locating the address of the different functions in the VDSO ELF object, in the text section of that object, uh, you know, so because we need to know where those functions are, right? So that the dynamic the dynamic symbol table has that information, and the kernel has populated the addresses of the of the VDSO functions into that symbol table. So what happens is, uh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, so one thing to mention is the VDSO mapping also has this data page. Not only has text uh, code, it also has this data page. And that data page has, in the case of clock get time, it has all of the information that clock that the VDSO version of clock get time needs to, cal to calculate the time. So uh, the formula for that is basically it needs to know uh, what the, time is so far, and it needs to add the uh, value of the uh, the delta between the last time keeping update and the current one uh, uh, with that with that time scaled by a slope. So long story short, all of that information is in the data page. And these functions that are in the text section of the VDSO, they will uh, refer to this uh, data page section and it will and pull out all the information it needs from that and uh, for, for their for their needs and, and and run and I believe that data page can be constantly modified by the kernel because you know um, the timekeeping update is being done by the kernel right uses VDS is only reading the time so the kernel will update the data page with like every time the timekeeper updates it will also update the data page uh, so that whoever is using the VDSO to read the current time will be able to do its job, right? And here's a, uh, a diagram I pulled out of the ARM uh, documentation. And uh, it's basically goes into a little more detail about how the VDSO is loaded. So first you have the kernel loading the, uh, uh, the kernel's ELF loader, uh, loading the uh, ELF of the, uh, of the uh, program that is about to run. But what it does that it also maps the VDSO pages into the address space of that of the program, and there's this thing called the auxiliary vector where it stores a pointer to that VDSO uh, mapping. Okay, and then we switch to user space, and the dynamic linker looks at that auxiliary vector table, gets the pointer of the VDSO ELF uh, mapping, and uh, it may it just makes a note of that VDSO uh, mapping location. And uh, uh, you know it hands off control to the C library. Now the dynamic linker also provides certain helpers that the C library can call to look up the VDSO uh, ELF images dynamic symbol table. So the C library basically, when it when the C library initializes, it looks up the the values of all those symbols, the location of all the symbols, and it sets some global variables uh, to uh, those values. So for get time of day, there's a underscore underscore VDS, so underscore get time of day symbol. It gets the address of that symbol, stores it in a global function pointer. And then from there on, anybody who does get time of day from user space uh, ends up calling that VDSO function. So essentially, the kernel has made it possible to execute custom code 
in user space that it decided. So the kernel decided this is what, you know, this is what you're going to run if you wanted to get time of day, and then user space um, runs it. So it's very kernel centric, kernel controlled, um, and user space doesn't need to do anything. It's fully transparent to the user as well because they just use the C library without knowing that under the hood, uh, VDSO, the C library is actually using VDSO dynamically for performance. The user doesn't need to care about VDSO at all. They just have to use the C library and the C library will decide if it's going to use the syscall or it's going to call the VDSO. Does that make it'll, sense? It'll make the switch. Uh, by the way, there is a dynamic flag. You can turn it off and on, if I okay. remember correctly, on okay. per process basis. So you could turn it off and run it and with or without video. So if you want to play with it, it's it's a lot of fun playing with it that way too. Oh, you really is it see, a compiler flag or? Um, it's actually a, um, a flag in the under the CISF, a kernel or a CISFS. Oh, yeah, I think that's that, yeah, okay. yeah, video so flag. That's kind of fun to play with if you are interest, curious yeah. about that. You could uh, do some uh, benchmarks could, with that. Yeah, benchmarks with that. Um, have yeah. a process, pick a process um, that does maybe lots of time calls back to back in a loop. And then uh, we, uh, start one with VDSO and uh, without one without, yeah. and see what kind of improvement you will get. Um, yeah. That. So that's that's interesting. I might do that too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's a fun fun process because yeah. you can flip out, uh, flip that off and on. Yeah. So that's kind cool. of fun fun experiment to do when you yeah when you want some fun <laughs> to have some fun with figuring out which system yeah. calls do better. Yeah. Yeah. With, perfect. Direct versus VDSO. So sure, are there any, uh, I was planning to maybe add some tests to the kernel sources for timers. Mm -hmm. Like especially some of this timer wheel stuff. I mentioned like some issues with accuracy of the timer wheel. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, there I just a, wanted... the, Yeah, we do have timers section and there is, um, you can okay. just go ahead and add that. Um, and if you want okay. uh, somebody to help you, just we can talk offline. Okay. Yeah, we can do, yeah, we'll do that. Cool. So, um, any I other questions? Most of the time, yeah. Hey, thanks for the nice comments. Uh, yeah, uh, you know, I hope like more people start contributing to the kernel. Like one of the things that I look at, where, where you know, when I look at all this stuff, I see a lot of opportunity to, uh, you know, make changes and, um, just explore the design of a lot of these things um, and, and make improvements. So I would certainly encourage everybody to, to do that. Um, yeah, if, if yeah, this is something people are interested in, yeah. Right, we're kicking off uh, another mentoring uh, session in March. Okay. So um, I'll, I might reach out and ask you if you have any ideas like testing, tests you want to be written or something for the mentees okay. that are starting. Perfect, yeah, let me know, perfect. Okay, yeah. cool. Thank you, Joel. And All right. Thank you. All right. We'll kick it back to Candace. Perfect. Thank you, Joel and Shua, for your time today. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. As a reminder, this recording will be on the Linux Foundation's YouTube page later today. And a copy of the presentation slides will be added to the Linux Foundation website. We hope you join us for future mentorship sessions. Have a wonderful day.